نحمده نستعينه نستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يدع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعسهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قال عيسى ابن مريم يا بني إسرائيل إني رسول الله إليكم مصدقا لما بين يدي من التوراة ومبشرا برسول يأتي من بعده اسمه أحمد فلم فلما جاءتهم البينات قالوا هذا سحر مبين أما بعد فقال عز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتون إلا وأنتم مسلمون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقلدة من اللسان يفكه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وردنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باقلا وردنا اجتنابا آمين Today I want to talk about two different issues. One is the relationship between the, the Qur'an and the previous books sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The relationship that exists between the, the two. And they exist at many levels. And so I want to clarify this. And the second thing that I want to clarify is the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Bible. I will be referring to some. You know the Qur'an's claim that Prophet Muhammad is taught in the Bible is so emphatic, so emphasized that the Qur'an says يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُ They know Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in their books as they know their own children. Meaning it is so clear that the teachings of the Bible, if they were to read, they would find the mention of Prophet Muhammad So we have to ask ourselves the question, does the Bible really, at any point, really refer to Prophet Muhammad And also, the second issue, the first issue that I said that I'm going to be talking about is If what is the relationship between the Bible and the Quran, or the not only the Bible, but the Torah and the Bible and then the Quran and the Zubur? What is the relationship between the previous books and the Quran? So, in talking about this, I just want to first read this verse to you, and then I will be actually uh, elucidating on this particular verse of the Quran and talking more about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ And when Isa, meaning Jesus, the son of Mary said, وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ O children of Israel, إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ I'm a messenger to you, O Bani Israel. As you know, this is a very important point, that Jesus himself, not on one occasion, but on many occasions, has said in, even in the Bible, in the New Testament, you can find it, where he says, I have come to find the lost sheep of Israel. So he came specifically for the Jewish community of that time. And this is why they had the whole uh, issue of the Gentiles versus uh, if his message can be preached only to the Gentiles, which Jesus made very clear that his message is specifically for the Jews, not on one occasion, but on many occasions, but I don't want to go into more into this other than mentioning the statement of Jesus, peace be upon him, where he said, I have come to find the lost sheep of Israel. So this is what's being referred to here. Now in terms of Qur'an's relationship with the previous books, what Qur'an does, and this is very significant, because I hope you're able to grasp what I'm about to say. When you read Qur'an, it also gives you interpretation of dreams. For example, today I'm going to teach you how you can do dream interpretation using the Qur'an and then I'll come back to it because I want to make a point that has to do with the Qur'an and the previous books. 
The Quran mentions many parables, many images. For example, if you take the story of Prophet Yusuf والسلام, the Prophet Joseph, if you take his story, very quickly I want to go over this so that I can come back to my main point. If you take the story, the story of Yusuf or the story of Joseph is about dreams in the Quran itself. Right? So the first dream he has, he sees the sun and the moon bowing down to him. Right? And you find in the Quran that the stars sometimes in the hadith of the Prophet so for example, the Prophet said, as sahabi bin Najum, my companions are like the stars, the Prophet said. But also, the stars have been referred to as human beings. For example, إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ أَشَاهِدًا وَمُبَشِّرًا وَنَذِيرًا وَدَاعِيًا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَسِرَاجًا مُنِيرًا Like he's a blazing lamp, Prophet Muhammad. But the word that's used is the sun. So, we know from the story of Yusuf that even though he's seeing stars and celestial objects, but celestial objects can sometimes in dreams refer to a human being, a particular human being. Okay? So this is, I'm just giving a quick analysis. In the second dream, for example, in the second dream, the person saw the, the, person saw the crow eating from his head. I won't go into the third dream and the fourth dream because they're longer, but just I'll give these two dreams. Crow, as you know, is, 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 most of the time it's not a halal animal. Okay? It's a haram animal on your head eating from your head. And because of it being a haram animal eating from you, it means something negative. Okay? So how do you do dream interpretations? One way is, somebody who is familiar with Qur'an and Qur'anic parables and Qur'anic examples and Qur'anic language, he can look at the dreams and then look at how those dreams relate to the parables in the Qur'an. And so as Qur'an is a book of guidance, in, like, in terms of law, do this, don't do this, as Qur'an is a book of something that elucidates nature and science and exploration and observation of nature, Qur'an is also a book of dreams. At the same time, see this is now why I wanted to go over this, at the same time Qur'an is a book that finds its way to attach itself to the previous books but also remove the faults in it. Because obviously, the Bible has been changed. I mean, this is not something that uh, is new. I mean, this is something that's accepted amongst all scholars because Jesus spoke Aramaic and we don't have a Bible in the language that he spoke it. And by the way, I've mentioned this many times, but I'll mention it again, which is the language that Jesus spoke was a sister language of Arabic. Because all of these languages, Arabic, Aramaic, Syriac, Chaldean, these are all similar languages. If you know one of them, they have the same grammar. And in fact, in the time of the Prophet, if you read writings, many of them were inter using interchangeable words between Syriac and Arabic and, A and Aramaic and Arabic and Aramaic and Hebrew. They were using these interchangeably because they were basically the same set of languages. Anyway, the point I want to make is, what Qur'an does is Qur'an refers to the stories in the Bibles. And as Qur'an is referring to the stories in the Bibles, where there is a difference, specifically, Qur'an corrects what? Qur'an doesn't, what is right for the general part is right. Qur'an doesn't comment on it. But the parts where there are mistakes, those are the parts Qur'an mentions to fix those mistakes. So you take out the parts from the Bible as they exist. So let me give you one example so you understand this a little bit better. The tartib or the ordering of the prophets of the of the Prophet is not mentioned anywhere in the Quran. That Adam came first, then Nuh came, then Ibrahim came, then such and such prophet came. This we get from the Bible. Because Quran didn't correct this. Because the Quran didn't correct the tartib itself, we didn't change the tartib itself. We didn't change the ordering of who came first, second, third, fourth. Because Qur'an didn't correct it. But wherever Qur'an feels a need to correct something, not in the sense of saying, oh, this is wrong, but Qur'an will just simply make a statement like I just read. Why is Qala Isa ibn Maryam? Ya Bani Israel, inni Rasulullah ilaykum. Oh, children of Israel, I'm a messenger of Allah to you. Musaddiqan lima bayna yadayya min al-tawrati wa mubashiran bi rasuli ya'ti min ba'di ismu Ahmad. I'm a messenger from Allah to you, confirming that which was before me. As you know, Jesus said, again, you can find this in the Bible, Jesus said, I have, come, I have not come to break the law. 
I have not come to break the law. I have come to fulfill the law. I have come to complete the law. But what happened was that the, the law was there. The law was the same. But people were looking or had found, you can say, loopholes in the law. And in order to fix those loopholes, Jesus was saying things that other people, the rabbis, they didn't like. Let me give you an example. Actually, this was going to be my lecture today, was going to be on talaq, but I'm, because of the brother that's here, I changed it to this one. So, let me give you an example. In the issue of talaq, in the issue of divorce, in you know Christianity, for the most part, I mean, until the Protestants came, even, even now, a lot of them, they believe that a woman cannot have a divorce in Christianity. Why did this happen? Because in Jewish law, it was very simple. A man, according to Jewish law, according to the Talmud, all he has to do is write for his wife, I divorce you, give her the piece of paper, and she's divorced. There's no idda, there's no period of trying to reconcile the both, or trying to make the marriage work. Just simply the man is angry, he writes it, or he says it to her, and divorce happens instantaneously. So in order to cover that, in order to cover that, Jesus emphasized marriage, and how important it is that you cannot get divorced, and you should not get divorced, and you should try to make the marriage work. So, as a reaction, what happened? Christianity adapted that, oh, you can't get divorced at all. Whereas what Jesus really wanted was, and what Islam really wanted was, is that there should be a middle way. It shouldn't be that so easy to get divorced, but it should not be that it's impossible to get divorced, just as it was in the original law. And over here, this is another thing that I want to mention. The relationship between the Qur'an and the previous books, and the relationship between all the Prophets going up to Prophet Muhammad is what? It's very important because of what I'm about to mention, to understand this. It is not like a lot of people think. And I've mentioned this before, but again, it's important. That one prophet came, then another prophet came, then another prophet came, then another prophet came. And then, you know, just Allah arbitrarily decided, okay, Muhammad is the last messenger of Allah, and time just ended. This is not what happened. Law was coming to completion. Man was still becoming mature. When you were in a cave society, or a tribal society, you couldn't give detailed economic laws. You were in a tribal society at the time of Musa They were in a tribal society. They had laws according to the, tribe, the tribal systems. But then by the time of Isa, by the time of Jesus, peace be upon him, you had empires. The Roman Empire, as you know, ruled the land of Jesus, Jesus peace be upon him. So you had entire empires. So now when you have empires, you, your laws cannot be just tribal. They have to be more complicated, more sophisticated, more in more detail. So... Jesus was trying to help, the, uh, to expand the law, to remove the, the, the loopholes that they had found, and also expand the laws, but he was getting a lot of hindrance from the people around him. Keep this in mind, because I'm going to show you a quote of Jesus, peace be upon him. Because one thing, and to the Muslims, a very unfortunate thing that has happened in Paulian Christianity, is that, you know, Jesus said... I have not come to break the law. Jesus practiced the law. He went to the synagogues. He practiced the Sabbath. He prayed uh, on his face. He did wudu. It's all in the Bible. Okay? But after him, a man by the name of Paul came who totally changed the teachings of Jesus. Peace be upon him. How did he change the teachings? Jesus said, I've come to find the lost sheep of Israel, Paul who is the main writer of the Bible in terms of he sets the direction of the faith, Paul says, oh, no, 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 it's for the Gentiles and for the Jews. Jesus said, be careful what you eat. He gave dietary laws, and the, Jew, the Jews and the Christians both practiced dietary laws, like, for example, not eating swine, which is, by the way, twice in the Bible. Do not eat the swine, it's twice in the Bible. In Le Leviticus and also Deuteronomy. But... What happened? Paul said, oh, it doesn't matter what you eat. He said, 
you will be condemned by the law because if we make laws, you have to pray, you have to do wudu, you have to do sayam, you have to do zikat. If you have all these laws, you'll be condemned by it because you'll never be able to do everything Allah wants and you'll be condemned by it. So the only thing you need to save your faith is to have faith in the death that Jesus died as a savior for you. This is the only thing you need. And so one of the differences between, uh, one of the corrections Quran makes between the Bible and the Quran itself is Quran always emphasizes <laughs> those who believe and do good deeds. Because as Paul wrote about grace, it's called grace in the Bible, Paul wrote, you have to be saved by grace, by your faith. You cannot be saved by your works. And James, who is the brother of Jesus and who was in charge of the ministry of Jesus after Jesus passed away, or had been raised by Allah to the heavens, he said, even the devils believe in God. It's their works that they don't have. Even the devil shivers by the, by the name of God. He has faith too. He needs good deeds to save himself. Anyway, so I was saying that Prophet Muhammad, as we see it, from a perspective, and this is why the Prophet said that a person who believes in Jesus and then he believes in Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet said he'll get the twice the reward. Because the way we see it is that Muslims, we see it as we embrace the message of Jesus. And we embrace that you have to fulfill the commands. We embrace the teachings that he gave. And I'm going to specifically talk about when he talked about Prophet Muhammad in the Bible. So then Jesus says, all, what is all Isa ibn Maryam? And when Isa ibn Maryam, he said, Inni Rasulullahi ilaykum. I'm a messenger of Allah to you. Which Jesus refers to in the Bible over and over again. The Father has sent me. The Father has sent me. The Father has sent me. Inni Rasulullahi ilaykum musaddiqan lima bayna yadayya min al I confirm, I agree, I have come to establish the law of Torah and Zubur. I've come for that. I'm not going to abrogate that. No. And then Jesus says, وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولِي مِنْ بَعْدِي And I come with the good news. What does gospel mean? The word gospel. Gospel means good news. Good news. What is the good news that Jesus came for? Because the distance between Prophet Muhammad and Jesus is 600 years. And just as a side point, philosophically speaking, and organizationally speaking, humanity had already reached at its peak. All the different types of philosophies that were going to emerge had already emerged. And all the different systems of humanities, you can say for the, by and large, now, you know, it's the same thing that can have different shapes, but democracy had already come, for example. The caste system had already come too. So all the human, you can say, Systems had already come by the time of Jesus, peace be upon him. And the distance between Jesus and Prophet Muhammad is 600 years. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Wasalamun ala al-mursaleen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet said, Inni mubashiran bi rasooli min ba'di. I come giving good news of a messenger after me. Ismu Ahmad. His name will be Ahmad. And the people who are aware of the Bible, if they hear this, they will be aware of what I'm trying to say. Everyone at the time of Jesus, because of the oppression of the Roman Empire, and because of the poverty everyone was in, everyone was looking for a Messiah at the time of Jesus, peace be upon him. And everyone was looking for a man who will find them the way out of this situation, the dire situation of oppression that they were in. And they would say to, to Jesus, are you Elijah who's come back? They would say to John the Baptist, are you him? Are you him? Are you the Messiah? They said to John the Baptist. I can't go into details right now. But the point is, they were looking for a savior, for a Messiah. And that Messiah was Jesus, peace be upon him. Because we Muslims believe him to be the Messiah. But, there was another one after him. And he mentions that not in one, it's not mentioned in one gospel or two gospels, it's mentioned in all of the gospels. Now I'm going to give to you that particular quote that I'm referring to in the Bible. Now, the background of this is that Jesus now knows 
that he's going to be raised by Allah. He knows I'm going to be raised by Allah. And this is found in John chapter 16, verses 7 through 14. Okay? He says, now that he's told his companions, I'm going to go, I have to go to God, he now has a last message to give, a last point to make. He has to give them some confidence that something will happen, that this message is going to continue even after him. It's not come to an end yet. So what does Jesus say in the Bible? He says, nonetheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. Jesus says, it is expedient for you that I go away. It is better for you that I go away. Why? For if I go not away, the comforter. Now just remember this, this person who is not an it, it's not a spirit because the spirit was already, because the, the, the normal biblical translation of the word comforter is the Holy Spirit. But my answer is, number one, if you know the language, it's not an it, it's a he. In the language of Aramaic. Number two, and also in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Latin as well as in the Greek, it's, it's, uh, it's He. Number two, the Holy Spirit already existed in the time of Jesus. And the Quran mentions this all the time whenever it mentions Jesus. It mentions uh, about Jesus and the Holy Spirit being together. They were already there. The Holy Spirit was already there. But He says, Nonetheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I do not go away, the comforter, the word is parakletus in Greek, by the way, and parakletus means the admirable one, the admirable one. The word parakletus, which is translated as comforter, means the admirable one. What does the word Muhammad mean? What is the meaning of the word Muhammad or Ahmad? The praised one, the admirable one, right? The one who is... Who is, who, is, who is praised. The word in, in Greek that's translated from English is Paracletus. He says, this is not it, just watch. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the comforter, meaning the Paracletus, the admirable one, the praised one, he will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he comes, what will happen? He will reprove the world of sin. He will remove, practically, he will remove the world of sin. When Prophet Muhammad was here, he established Islam. He established the laws of God on earth. He brought the judgment, which I'm going to talk about. He will remove the sins, number one. And the righteousness and judgment of sin, and he will bring the law and the completion of the law, and he will establish the judgment, and remove the sin, then, because if they believe not in me, he's talking about the others, he's, to his disciples, he's saying, if they don't believe in me, then what? Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, meaning I'm going to Allah, I'm going to the Father, and ye see me no more, uh, you see me more, no more, because, the prince, uh, then I'm going to uh, just skip ahead. I have yet a lot of things to say unto you. He says, I have a lot of things to tell you, but you can't understand them. You won't get them. You won't see what I'm trying to get to. But wait for the comforter to come. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth, has come. And the word spirit in the Bible does not mean spirit, by the way. It can also mean a person. A spirit, like, the, in the biblical language, just so that if there's a Bible student here, he will know flesh and spirit, these are opposites. Like Jesus said, the, uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The, the, the truth, the spirit of truth means the person of truth. But he is not a person of flesh. He is a person of the spirit. He is a person whose spirituality dominates him. What will he do when the spirit of truth comes? That man that he was saying will come after him, who will reprove the world of, remove sin and establish righteousness, what will he do? But you cannot bear them now, what I want to tell you. Albeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you unto all truth. He will guide you unto all truth. 
For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he heareth, he shall say. What is Quran? Quran is the idea that he heard the revelation and he says it. What else? And he will show you things to come. That's what a prophet is. A prophet tells you this will happen and this will happen and this will happen. He gives you prophecies that this will happen. And then, and he will show you things to come and he shall glorify me. Jesus says, that man, that admirable one, the Paracletus, the spirit of truth, when he comes, not only will he remove sin, he will also talk about me. He will glorify me. And he shall receive of mine and he will know really what I'm about. And he shall show all things unto you and he will remain with you forever in another part of the Bible. And he will abide with you forever. Who is this person that is called the Admirable One that came after Jesus, that spoke of Jesus, that came after Jesus and established justice and truth for people to see? Who is this Jesus talking about that will come, this person that will come after him? Who is Jesus talking about? Other than Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who was the man who came, who talked about Jesus, praised Jesus, and said he's going to come after me. Inshallah, I will continue in my second khutbah. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولساء المسلمين والمسلمات. الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه نستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد so please move forward also in John chapter fourteen verse sixteen Jesus says in another place in the same gospel I will pray the Father he says, I will do dua to Allah. What? That He will sh send you another comforter. Another comforter. Another advocate. Another one. And He may abide with you forever. And this one that will come to you after me, He will be with you forever. Then... In John chapter 15, verse 26. And when the Comforter is come, I will send him unto you from the Father. And even he, being the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. This man who will come after, after Jesus, who will speak of Jesus and glorify Jesus. But in chapter 14, verse 26. And for the Comforter, which is the Spirit of truth, when the Father send him in my name, he shall teach you all things. He'll teach you all things. In the previous verse, he said, you can't bear to hear all things. Here he's saying, he will teach you all the things. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So Prophet Muhammad taught the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him. And so, this is not the only place. I mean, there may, there's like, at least, I can count at least, 70, 80 places in the Bible where Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is mentioned. But this is significant because this is very clear even in the English language. I will send another comforter after you. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ And remember, when Isa ibn Maryam, he said, إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ I am a messenger of Allah. How does Jesus refer to himself in the Bible? I have been sent by the Father. I am the way to the truth. The way to the truth. He says, the Father is greater than I. He says, I cast out the devils by the permission of God. I cast out the devils, but by the permission of God. Jesus, peace be upon him, he prayed like everyone else prayed, to the same God. And not only he prayed to the same God that everyone else prayed, but how did he pray? He prayed on his face, like the way Muslims pray on their face. 
Prophet Muhammad taught us to pray the way, the way Jesus taught us to pray. If I had time, I would show you that where Jesus talks about doing wudu, he did wudu exactly the way we do wudu. You heard this news recently where the Pope washed the feet? Do you know what that has? That has to do with wudu. Jesus talks about, he, when he washed the feet of, of one of his disciples, he said, there's a conversation, he says, but I want you to also wash my hands and my head. And then Jesus said, but if you've taken a shower, you don't need, need to do wudu again. You don't need to wash yourself again if you've already taken the shower. You just need to do your feet. Does that sound familiar to you? It's in the Bible. So, 